okay? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 John. And for those of you who are new to the Scripture, there's no shame in that. Uh, there are a lot of people in this world that live their entire lives and never open the Bible. And so if you are new to Scripture, it's toward the end. In fact, it's the last three books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, well, actually, there's Jude, and then there's Revelation. So it's really toward the end of the New Testament. So on, uh, in my Bible, it's page 1,840. Not that that makes any difference to your Bible. To you and your Bible, because I'm sure the pages are different. So, uh, I want to say Happy Father's Day to you. Now, someone noticed, as someone who had a lot of time on their hands, but they noticed that the word Father appears in the dictionary just before the word fatigued and just after the word fathead. And so to all you fatigued, fathead fathers, happy Father's Day. On this special day, I thought it would be appropriate to bring a message of encouragement and a challenge to, to our fathers uh, and to our, the men in general in our church. If there is ever a time that fathers need to stand up, it, it is now. If there's ever a time when men need to stand up in our world, in our community, it is now. The institution of the family is in rapid decline. It's due to the decades of attack and a systematic dismantling of the nuclear family. So in the church, we must fortify the family. And we should offer our communities God's perspective on the family. And we should do that by way of example, the way that our families conduct themselves, and by instruction. We should teach our community what God says, the originator of the family, the designer of the family, the creator of the family, what he says about the family. And we should do this because there's a catastrophic collapse of societal stability on the horizon. In fact, I think it's, uh, we, we are fast approaching the point of no return, where the families are under attack, and we are seeing the erosion of family values. The foundation has some cracks in it that I don't know that, are, that we're able to repair. And I believe that it's only a matter of time before the whole thing comes crumbling down. Well, you say, well, Pastor, why is such a doom and gloom message on a happy occasion like Father's Day? Well, because I believe it's important that we talk about what is happening in the family in hopes of restoring the family, in hopes of regenerating uh, our families. I want to read to you just some statistics. Now, this is not all, but it's just some, just a few statistics about uh, when the father is absent in the home. What happens generally? Let me read these to you. 85% who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. 85% of those who are incarcerated in the United States grew up without a father in their home. Seven out of every 10 youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities, including detention and residential treatment, they come from fatherless homes. Children without fathers 
are four times more likely to live in poverty than children with a father. Children from fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop, uh, to drop out from school before graduating than children who have a father in their lives. One in every uh, three children in the United States live in a home where their biological father is not present. Girls who live in a fatherless home have a 100% higher risk of suffering from obesity than girls who have their father present. Teen girls from fatherless homes are also four times more likely to become promiscuous. Children who live in single-parent home uh, are two times more likely to commit suicide than children in a two-parent home. 75% of adolescent patients being treated in substance abuse centers come from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who exhibit some type of behavioral disorder come from fatherless homes. About 40% children in the United States are born to mothers who are not married. Pregnant women who do, do not have the support of the father experience pregnancy loss at a 48% rate. When the father is present, the prevalence of pregnancy loss falls to 22%. 43% of fathers do not see their role as something that is important to their personal identity. These are just some of the statistics. You can find these statistics all day long. You can go to government website. You can go to research centers. You can go to uh, family advocate centers, and they will all have these lists, and some, an extensive list. I just pulled out some of them. But it's an extensive list of what happens in the life of a child when the father is not present. Now, at this point, many of us would like to check out of the conversation. When I had these conversations with people, many of them say, well, it's, it's not my problem. I'm not a father. I don't have children of my own. I'm not a parent. And some of us will say, well, I did my part. My kids are grown. They're gone. So my responsibility is done. I did my part. But if you read through these statistics and you remove yourself from being a part of any solution because you don't think you are part of the problem, then you are part of the problem for not being a part of the solution. The fact of the matter is, every single one of us can and must be a part of the solution. But what is the solution? In a nutshell, the solution is Jesus. He's the answer. Well, that's a great Sunday school answer, though, isn't it? I mean, when you go to Sunday school and you don't know the answer, you just raise your hand and say, Jesus, because chances are that's the right answer, right? More times than not. But that's not a practical answer. We know that Jesus is the answer. What, what about Jesus is the answer? It's in knowing him and being changed by him, and being led by him, that he himself is the only viable solution to our needs. So if you have your Bibles and you've already turned there to 1 John chapter 2, this is uh, in this uh, apostolic letter, John speaks in, uh, with authority to affirm the position that we have in Christ and the effects of knowing him 
as Lord and Savior. I'm just going to look at three verses, okay? And all God's people said, amen. 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 Just three verses. Sometimes we tackle a bunch of verses. Today it's just three verses I want us to look at. Verse uh, 12 in chapter 2, 1 John. Let's look at it. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. In my earlier understanding of this passage, and I've even heard it preached and studied it in in seminary, I used to think that this was uh, where John, the Apostle John, is talking to three different groups of people that he's talking to the children and then he's talking to the young men and he's talking to the fathers in their three different stages of life. And I thought that in his audience were little children and in his audience were also young men and in his audience were also fathers. But now I'm convinced that instead of him talking or writing to three groups of people in various stages of life, He is writing to every single believer as they encounter all three stages of life, in some cases simultaneously. That's why I'm calling it the trinity of man or the trinity of a person. And I think instead of him pointing out the three different groups of people, he's pointing out the three different characteristics of a person in a single person's life. Hopefully, we'll come to understand that as we read along. We are his children. We are his fearless warriors and spiritual leaders to those who come after us. Jesus himself said, Matthew 18, verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That tells me that there is a, a, a humility, a a humble life the, 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 that you, you can't do this thing alone and that you need to be saved. So in this journey of life, every believer must be strong and courageous, but our posture toward God must always be humble and childlike. That's why we say sometimes, we maybe under our breath or maybe in our prayer, or maybe, maybe just in the closet when we are alone with God, we say, I need you, Lord. I need you. I'm desperate for you. I can't go it alone. I can't do it without you. Now let's just kind of break it down and go through it verse by verse. Verse 12 I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's a humble posture in it, to, to be ch- like a child, to, to be a child. It's, it's a humble posture. We know that we cannot rid ourselves of the guilt and shame of sin. No matter how hard we try, we cannot rid ourselves Shame, guilt, sin. We know that the penalty of sin 
is death, and we know that Jesus is the only one who can forgive our sin. So he says, I ri I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did, your sins are forgiven. You couldn't forgive your own sin. You couldn't rid yourself of the sin. Jesus had to do it for you. We come to Jesus as a helpless child, desperate to be rescued from the clutches of sin. We used to not know any better about sin. But now we do. And we hate sin. But even as adults, we can't always avoid sin. We can't, we, we, we can't seem to shake. In, in, in some sense, they are just repetitive. We can't seem to overcome them. So as long as we sin, we have to come to Christ as children who can't deal with sin on our own but need a deliverer from sin. In fact, that's how this whole chapter starts out. I want you to look at, go back to uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. It says this. It says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John is saying that. We know that we, we, we don't want to sin. But sometimes we do, and when we do, we have an advocate with the Father. We have Jesus who intercedes for us. Men, especially men, The church needs to see us model humility. They need to see us model a lifestyle, a sense of dependence on God, a reliance on God. You know, in, in love relationships, you tell your spouse something, or she tells you something. And a lot of things go in one ear and out the other, but then there are some times when they, they will say something that is so profound that you remember it for the rest of your life. Here's one that Donna told me. And it's not pick up your socks, it's not that, no. <laughs> Donna told me one day that she feels the most secure when she sees me on my knees in prayer. Think about that statement. What is she saying? That a man who is dependent on God and not himself, that's when he's at his best. That's when he's strongest. Think about that. How many of us try to go it alone and oh, if I'm going to be a man, then I, I, I need to do this on my own. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Man is strongest when he is dependent on God. Don't be a lone ranger. Don't buy into the lie that you have to fake it until you make it. Instead, daily come to Jesus as a dependent child. Look at verse 13. He says, I am writing to you fathers because... You know who uh, you know 
him who is from the beginning. So the, the term father in this context can literally mean elder or senior. Okay? Now, I know that in the United States, they consider senior after you turn 65, right? But you can get, like, all kinds of freebies after you turn, I think, 55. You get some discounts, like at Denny's and places, when you turn 50, right? Uh, but whatever that word means in our context, in our culture, the word father here can literally mean those who are elders, and you know what, I, I, I think we miss out on the gem, we, we miss out on the, the value and the blessing of elders in our church. I don't mean the council member elder, I mean, and obviously they have value, but I'm just talking about the, the older folks in our church. And I somehow wish that we had some kind of ministry or some, some, some kind of conduit, some kind of avenue. We, we have... We have so many members in our church that are at the, the last stages in their lives, and yet they have lived rich, valuable lives. Their experiences, the things that they have gone through, the things that they have seen, just, just amazing things. I wish we could connect our kids, our young people, our teenagers, even ourselves, those of us that are 15 uh, 20 years younger than them, even, even us who are getting up in age, if, if we were able to somehow have these conversations and just listen to the things that they went through, I think it would be so much valuable to, to our lives. There's a couple of guys, a couple of old guys, they're good friends of mine. Uh, they grew up in Taiwan. Now, you got to get the whole picture of this, okay? Uh, they are Chinese in Taiwan, and when it, during World War II, the Japanese occupied Taiwan, and they made them go to Japanese schools and learn Japanese. So now, when I see them in the hallway, we talk Japanese. I mean... First of all, they're not holding any grudges toward me. Of course, I wasn't born until long after World War II. I know I looked like maybe I was there, but I wasn't. <laughs> so, first of all, they don't hold any grudges. But just, just to sit and listen to their stories and how they endured certain things and how they came to faith in Christ through their lives. What a valuable lesson. What, what a wonderful thing to receive from them. I wish there was a way that we could take our kids to the nursing homes where these people are and just sit and listen to their story. Fathers, you know him who is from the beginning. That word know is not just, it's not just, knowledge, but it has a meaning of intimacy. You, you, have, you have known him who is from the beginning. You have walked with him. You, you, have, you have been with him in your tears. You have been with him on the mountaintops and in the valley. What a valuable story you have. This word for father, figure, figuratively, it, it's anyone who is of ahead of others in the spiritual journey. Many of you on Father's Day, you go, well, I'm not a father. Well, you're, you're not a biological father, but you are a father, a spiritual father to many who are coming after you. You have a lot to offer. If you have journeyed with the Lord through cancer, or if you have suffered through not being able to have children of your own, or, or you lost a loved one, then you are an elder to those who are just beginning their journey. And you can be a source of encouragement for them as they encounter those challenges themselves. I 
There are people in our community, they've lost a child. I can't even begin to understand what that feels like, what it must be like, how to even get through it, how to, how to even get through the first hour of it, much less day after day, year after year. There are those of you who know exactly what it feels like. And as hard as it is, you know exactly how to get through it. You are a father. You are an elder. You are a senior to those who are battling that journey. The word know here is not just a knowledge of the person, but it, it means intimate knowledge through personal experience. Personal, not just facts. It says, you know him who is from the beginning, talking about Jesus. Elders and seniors are vital, a vital part of the body of Christ. And they are essential to the spiritual health of a church. Their knowledge and their experience of God's faithfulness are an encouragement to younger generations. I wish we could have the younger generation put down their phone. Their search engine and their social media. And pick up a conversation. Elders and seniors in our church. Still in verse 13, but the second part of it, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Now, let me just ask some of you who are like more, I'm, I won't say older, but more seasoned in your life, okay? Uh, what part of your younger days do you remember the most? What, what do you remember the most? Your glory days playing football or baseball or basketball? You know, or in my case, ping pong. What do, you, what do you remember most about your younger days? You felt invincible, right? You thought you could go out and you could conquer the world. Isn't it in your youth that, the, that you, you learn many things, right? You learn skills, you learn talents, you learn gifts and other attributes, you develop them as your youth, where you learn to maybe water ski or snow ski or maybe ride a bike or play a sport. That's, that's where you learn. That's where you develop your skills. That's why we say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? Right? By the way, does anyone else get annoyed when you're online and you're having to fill out something and they ask you, like, what year you were born in? You ever get annoyed because you have to scroll that thing, like, scroll, so it's like the price is right. You know, you just have to keep scrolling and scrolling till you finally get to your, your, uh, your, your year, right? Read them. I don't know about you, but it, your year might, e might not even be listed anymore, <laughs> Right? Oh, I get so annoyed with that. That's when you realize just how old you are. But it's in our youth that we learn to trust the Lord. It's in our youth that we learn and even memorize Scripture. In our youth, we can soak it up. That's why my, the, fir, the very first verse I, 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 I memorized, it was, I was 20 years old. I just became a Christian. And, and, and I still remember it to this day. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? Right? Uh, with, with my whole heart, I have sought you. Please don't let me stray from your command. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
I, I memorized that when I was 20 years old. That was uh, 42 years ago. And it's still there. Now I try to memorize verses, and I'm, I'm just so thankful that I memorized a lot of the verses back when in my 20s, because now I try, and it's so hard. It's like, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I have a hard time. I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't try, but I have a hard time. As a child, you should be protected from the evil one, but as a young person, that's when you learn to fight and overcome the evil one. Do you remember when you first learned to overcome the evil one? Do you remember that? Do you remember your first struggle, uh, your first victory over a struggle? Do you remember the first time you were able to resist temptation? John was reminding them. He's saying, I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the world. Don't forget, you have overcome the world. You have overcome the evil one. He no longer has a hold on you. He no longer has control of you. You can beat the guy anytime, anywhere. Look at the last part of verse 13. I write to you children. Now he goes back to children. So it's children, fathers, young men. Children, fathers, young men. I write to you children because you know the father. You know, this, it, that, that word no comes up again. And so it, in one of the connotations of the word no in the Bible, it involves both the Hebrew and Greek senses, okay? In the Hebrew sense, it's intimate or personal relationship, okay? So Moses, oh, I'm sorry, not Moses, Abraham knew Sarah. We all know what that means, right? It's not like, yeah, I, I know her, I know where she lived. When, he, when it says that he knew her, it was, a, it was intimacy. It was a personal relationship. But in the Greek sense, it's about the facts. What do we know about them? And so when you see the word no in the Bible, it's sort of combining both. On the one hand, it's a personal relationship, but on the other hand, it's the facts. So the gospel is first, the gospel is a personal relationship with the Father through his son Jesus. But second of all, the gospel is accepting the knowledge about that person. That's what we call doctrine. The problem that we have with, with Christianity today is it's either one or the other. It's either a personal relationship. Oh, I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. We're buddies. Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is my friend. We like that part, but we go and do our own thing, and we never study or, or live the gospel. On the other hand, it's all about the facts. It's what Jesus said to do. He said to do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. But we don't have a personal relationship with him. But here, when it says, you know the Father, it's both. It's a personal relationship with Jesus or with God, with the Father. through Jesus. And second of all, it is knowing the facts, doctrine knowing what he said. And then thirdly, it is a life that emulates that person. That's what the gospel is. It's, it's not just having a personal relationship with him. It's knowing the facts about him. It's knowing the doctrine. And then finally, it's about emulating him in our own life. Verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. There's that word again, personal. 
Now, the, the part of the fathers is, is almost word for word here as it was in verse 13. But then he adds something to what he writes to the young men. He says, you are strong. Look at it. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So he adds, you are strong, and then he also adds, because the word of God abides in you. And that's why, that's the reason, that's why they can overcome the evil one, because the word of God abides in them. Now this word for abide, the word abide, it has a sustained meaning. It, it, it means to stay or it means to remain. And so you can translate that. The Word of God stays in you. The Word of God remains in you. It's not a a one-time thing. You know, it's not you go to church and, and you go up front and boom, they bop you on the head with the Bible and all of a sudden by osmosis it's all in there and it's a one-time thing and now I'm good to go. It is... It means to remain. That that means that we ought to daily be in the Word of God and let the Word of God soak into us. If you don't have a a, a systematic daily time where you're either while you're driving, and thank God that you have so many uh, tools that you can use today and apps and things where you can have the Bible read to you as you're driving. You can have these apps where you, the Bible's being read to you as you're falling asleep, as you're waking up. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way, which is the way I like, is where you just sit down in a coffee shop or in, in, in a closet in your living room or wherever, and you just, and you just, you just read, intake, meditate, pray over it. Remain. It's, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's, it's not a hit or miss thing. It's getting into the Word and remaining in the Word and letting the Word remain in you. You can't have the Word remain in you unless you remain in the Word. It's a two-way street. And he says that's how you overcome the evil one. See, as a child... God protects you, but as a young man, he teaches you how to fight the evil one yourself. And you do that with an offensive weapon, which is the sword, which the Word of God, the Bible says, is the sword. So the way I see it, the trinity of man, the trinity of a person, In this verse, in these verses, God is speaking to our childlikeness, to the warrior in us, and to our seasoned, our seasoned veterans, our seniors, our elders. We have three postures. First, as a child of God, as children of God, We must always depend on God for the forgiveness of sin, trust in Him with our vulnerabilities, and find security in Him. Not to find security in anything else or anyone else, but to find security in Him. Then second, as a father would, we must lead those who come behind us into intimate knowledge of Jesus. Not just facts about him, but a personal relationship with him. And then third, we must be strong and courageous as young men by letting the word of God remain in us so that we can overcome the evil one. Men, 
Dads, will you lead the way? Will you lead the way in your home? Will you lead the way in our church? Will you lead the way in this world? Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to walk through this passage. Thank you for pricking my heart and, and challenging me as as a just as an individual, just as a, 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 a person who desires to follow you best I know how. Lord, I confess that I don't always get that right. In fact, I often get it wrong. Lord, you know my heart. I want to be what you've called me to be. I pray, Lord, that that's the prayer of every man, every husband, every father, every woman, every child, the sound of my voice. That our desire be a person that you want us. But I pray specifically and especially for the men in our church. Thank you that there are so many men in our church who not, not only talk about leading, but they lead their example. Lord, thank you that we have so many great examples. God, I pray that you will bless us as Men are inspired by your word, by this passage. They will lead in their home. They will lead in our church. They will lead our world. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name.